Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Nicole Fernandez, and I am the project manager for the Maternal and Infant Health Series. We welcome you this afternoon to our presentation by Dr. Judith Eckerly. We would like you to please place your name, location, and your title in the chat. And we will begin, and we're just going to give it a couple of more minutes. We know some folks had difficulty with the link. So we will we'll begin in about one or two minutes. Thank you so much. And this um, presentation is being recorded. Welcome everyone to our Maternal Infant Health Series. Today, you will hear Dr. Judith K. Eckerly speak to you today about the effects of drug and alcohol exposure on the developing brain. Our agenda for today is you will hear the brief presentation. You will also have a time um, at the end, maybe about 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A we'd ask that you would place those questions in the chat. Myself or Zora Darcott, who is online with me, will help to share those questions with Dr. Eckerly. Just to share a little bit about Wayside Recovery Center. Wayside provides gender-specific care um, in understanding the needs of women to critically optimize prevention and treatment. Wayside has been in existence for over 60 years, and we specialize in empowering women and breaking generation cycles of substance abuse. Wayside Recovery in our maternal and infant health series is hosting this Project ECHO, which ECHO stands for Extension of Community Healthcare Outcome Series in partnership with the Minnesota Department of Human Services, focusing on reducing maternal and infant health disparities. This series will continue through March of 2022 with cohort number two beginning in January. I would like to share with you a brief bio of Dr. Judith K. Eckerly. She is the medical director of the Adoption Medicine Clinic, AMC, at the University of Minnesota. 
Dr. Eckley assists families pre and post adoption with consultation, referral, and clinical services. Her academic interests include FASD research, adoption and foster care issues, and global advocacy for children. Without further ado, I'd like to present to you Dr. Judith K. Eckerly. Thank you very much for having me. Can you hear me okay? All right, yes. um, great. We will get started here. Um, I'm really interested in the various people who have signed on, so thank you for doing that. Um, it gives me a, a sense for who is with us today and kind of how to how to phrase this for our audience today. So I wanted to talk about the effects of drug and alcohol exposure on the developing brain. Um, and uh, I, I am the medical director for the Adoption Medicine Clinic, although um, sometimes I feel like that's a little bit of a misnomer because we work with so many um, families who are who have come together through adoption, who are fostering, and then we do see birth birth parents, birth families, kinship families as well. So um, we are not limited to seeing adoption or um, adoptive families, just um, in case you were wondering about what we do in terms of our pre and post adoption services or foster care services as well. So, um, and this is us. I usually start out with this because we have a comprehensive team here of uh, medical doctors. We have a pediatric psychologist with uh, multiple graduate students and postdoc students. We have nurses, we have occupational therapists, we have uh, outreach coordinators and uh, administrative assistants who all make our team run together. Um, uh, and if you haven't seen This Is Us as the TV show, um, I, I have only watched the first season for a number of reasons, uh, but I found it to be the most accurate uh, portrayal of adoption or transracial families that I have ever seen in popular media. So um, if you have the chance to see it, uh, it's well worth it in my opinion. So. Uh, so we are the Adoption Medicine Clinic of the University of Minnesota. It is an outpatient clinic. We serve families with children in foster care or those adopted, both domestically and internationally. It was originally founded in 1986, and it was originally founded working with internationally adopted children, which is why I think a lot of people don't realize that now um, we have expanded our services to include, um, like I said, birth parents, kinship families, um, uh, kids in foster care, and, and those who are adopted. Um, and we work with families pre-adoption, we work uh, when they are currently in foster care and then post-adoption. And we do a lot of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder evaluations and intervention recommendations, mental health services uh, and screening, and then research education and advocacy for best practices in prevention and interventions. Um, and as we go along, uh, feel free to put those questions in and um, uh, the moderators will either, you know, uh, insert those questions as we go, or we can also address those at the end. So, so today I'd like to describe the most commonly encountered prenatal drug and alcohol exposures for children, and then identify some of the short and long-term implications and what to consider when drug and alcohol exposures are present. So one of the things that we do is uh, work with families pre-adoption and work with uh, both what we call consultations and referrals. So consultations are working with families who are thinking about adopting. And a lot of times, uh, both for international and for domestic adoptions, they'll get a checklist saying, uh, yes, no, would consider things like cocaine exposure or alcohol exposure or moderate alcohol exposure versus mild alcohol exposure. And what does that mean? Um, and so we, we have a consultation that we do with families uh, in case you have parents or families that are interested to go through and talk about what their concerns are, what their questions are, and kind of how to go about those checklists to um, make them feel more comfortable and informed. Then we also work with families for pre-adoption referrals, and those are um, once the families are matched with a specific child, either, again, internationally or domestically, um, we can review the files and talk about kind of what we're seeing, what exposures we're seeing, what that might mean for, again, short and long-term outcomes. And why do we do this? What's the purpose? Well, we wanna find a family that can meet the child's needs. And um, after doing this for 15 years now, I've been um, uh, really, it's been really heartwarming to see um, how the range of different issues that some families are truly prepared to parent. And um, I might not be, uh, but you know, a family might have experience or the willingness or desire to parent a child who has major special needs or minor special needs. Um, and so we want to just find the best fit. 
We want them to be able to plan for the medical and emotional and social needs for their child and establish expectations. Um, and again, we do that through the review and we do that through um, sometimes seeing the child in person. But really expectations are the most important part. Um, you know, my mentor, Dr. Dana Johnson, some of you may have run into him at some point as the founder of our clinic, expectations uh, minus reality is, is disappointment. So um, we don't want families to be disillusioned. Um, the only children I've ever seen that were disrupted, meaning they were um, not able to be continued uh, parenting in that family and ended up in a disruption. The only families I've ever seen with that had expectations that were not realistic and then they ended up not being able to care for that child. So we really wanna prevent that. We really want families to be able to under, understand you know, what they're ready for um, without any judgment and for a child to find the right family for them. And you know, just briefly, Dr. Dana Johnson, who founded this with international adoption, we learned a lot of lessons with that. Um, and uh, a lot of kids were studied who were in orphanage care, who were institutionalized, who had neglect, um, you know, either just because there was one caregiver for 30 kids in a room or for whatever reason. And we learned a lot of lessons about neglect, abuse, trauma, transitions from our internationally adopted population uh, that we can apply broadly to kids who are uh, experiencing those same kinds of things in foster care here in the domestic US system, adoption in the, in the domestic US system. And then really, you know, the lessons that we're learning through all of the children, they're, they're you know, amazing teachers for us. And we're learning lessons that we would then like to apply more broadly to all kids who have experienced trauma, uh, what we call ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. Um, so, you know, through these children who are amazing survivors and, and so resilient, we're, they're teaching us the lessons that we need to learn in order to help, you know, kids all over the world, so. And, um, uh, we, you know, the adoption narrative that we used to have is that if you give them food and you give them love, you'll have a happy family at the end, you know, uh, happily ever after. And we know now that it takes more than that. I do put this up because that is my daughter uh, who has, you know, some lovely fruit and some meat and some cheese and all she ate at that lunch was that ketchup that you see there. So, you know, we do our best. We can't always, <laughs> we can't always uh, have things ideal, but, um, but we know now that we do need more than just food and love in order to make that happy family. So I'm really glad that you're here in order to uh, kind of take in some of the, the risk factors and some of the you know, encouraging news that we have from some of the studies that we have. Uh, because all of you know, the, the prenatal stressors can affect growth, brain development and function, attachment, mental health, even your genetics, your chromosome structures they've shown are affected by stress. Um, your stress sensitive system then uh, relates to how competent you are, negative or, or positive behaviors, emotional expression, stereotypes, motor skills, sensory processing, and language. So it affects all parts of a child and then adult. Um, and so we want to know how to deal with those. And, you know, looking at the bios of the people who have logged in, this won't be any surprise to you that into, you know, some of the last statistics, so 2016, there were over 400,000 children in the US foster care system with about 118,000 of them still waiting to be adopted um, and still around 5,000 inter-country adoptions that were happening each year. So we're still seeing a mix of children who are in foster care who are being domestically adopted or waiting um, as well as international adoptions. So the substance exposures in utero. Um, I, I saw recently a patient in clinic, um, an adoptive mom with a, with a child, and it was a follow-up visit. I had not seen her the first time. Um, but I talked to her, uh, and, and the bottom line was that her child was doing really well. She was doing really well. Um, and she had all sorts of substance exposures. And I just remember that visit. I'll always remember that visit because at the end I said, I, I think she's going to do well. You know, I, she's doing really well right now. She's at an older age. I think she's just going to do well. And the, the, adoptive mom cried because she just couldn't believe that someone was actually telling her that, you know, they thought optimistically or that their child was going to do well. And so, you know, while we all want to know what the risks are, and clearly I would rather that bio parents not use substance, substances in utero, um, it doesn't have to be something where, you know, every child is going to be, you know, permanently damaged, every child, you know, won't have any chances at that point. Um, and so again, I wanted to kind of you know, share some of what we've learned so that you can appropriately counsel families and, and parents that you're working with and that you're running into um, so that they have realistic expectations. 
The first topic is alcohol. And clearly, you know, we're going to run through these pretty quickly because each and every one of these topics could be probably an entire hour lecture in and of itself. Uh, but we will talk about each of them um, briefly. And then, like I said, I'm happy to answer any other questions as they come up. So alcohol exposure in utero. So first, I'm going to start with a couple things that surprised me when I was learning about FASD and alcohol exposure, um, because I think some of them are myths and some of them, you know, are not widely known. So alcohol is alcohol. So sometimes you'll say, uh, you'll hear women say, oh, well, it was just beer or, oh, I just had some wine at dinner or, you know, something like that. But alcohol is alcohol. It's whiskey, you know, same as beer, same as wine. Uh, it just depends on how concentrated the alcohol is. And so you can see here that uh, each drink here is divided into what we call a standard drink. And so that's one of the challenges in interviewing birth parents or birth mothers who might be consuming alcohol is that they might say, oh, I just had one drink a day. All right, well, what does one drink a day look like for you? Oh, half a bottle of vodka, that's my one drink. Okay, well, you know, half a bottle of vodka is not one standard drink, it's, you know, many drinks. So um, that's where we have to be a little bit uh, more interested in terms of um, the quantity, the type, um, so that we can kind of define how much alcohol we might be um, thinking is, is present in, in prenatal use. The other things is that uh, when we looked at some of the risk drinkers here in Minnesota at one point by the MDH, um, so the, the highest risk drinkers when we looked at the studies were single, so never married or divorced, separated or widow, um, either younger, so college age or older, so 35 to 50. And um, there are some reasons for that. Uh, college educated uh, surprised me. I thought, you know, I think some people have biases that um, it's really uneducated people or um, uh, people below the poverty line, you know, that last uh, income level there um, that might be the risk drinkers. And really, that's not true. Um, you can either have that or affluent um, incomes above $50,000 uh, or employed in higher level white collar occupations as well. One second. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, you know, having kind of stereotypes in our mind about who risk drinkers might or might not be uh, is interesting to know, you know, it can be all across the board in terms of who might be drinking in pregnancy. And you don't have to learn in this, uh, in this seminar how to diagnose FASD per se, but I just wanted to highlight the four major criteria here, which are basically small kids, so height or weight less than 10%, they have a unique cluster of minor facial features, central nervous system damage, meaning brain damage basically, um, or prenatal alcohol exposure. And those are the four. Um, and then we use those four in different combinations in terms of diagnostics. The bottom line for alcohol. So when we talk about all these substances, alcohol is the one that I'm probably the most concerned about because we know that it is directly neurotoxic to a developing brain. That said, I'm generally not concerned about minimal exposure, uh, again, you know, don't get me wrong. I would rather that women not use alcohol or, or substances during pregnancy, but a woman who had a couple, you know, true single drinks during pregnancy uh, before she knew she was pregnant, those kinds of things happen uh, frequently. And most of those kids actually will do fine. So, um, you know, sometimes I, I think the correct message is zero alcohol for nine months, you know, no alcohol during pregnancy. Um, but I think that some parents get so scared about that, then then they say, oh, well, you know, any alcohol then makes permanent brain damage. And really, you know, that's probably not the case. So, um, so the two kind of extremes of it is I'm generally not concerned about minimal exposure. I'm generally more concerned about what we call binge or sustained drinking. So binge drinking, meaning four or more drinks at one sitting, um, and usually, you know, usually multiple times, uh, and sustained drinking, meaning drinking throughout the entire pregnancy, most women know that it's not great to drink or drink you know, regularly during pregnancy. So if they're really drinking daily or really drinking regularly during their entire pregnancy, again, that one drink that they're having you know, every day, it really may not be a single drink. So I'm just more concerned kind of generally about, about those risk factors. Um, and then if you look at that development chart, you can see here, you know, some of the uh, charts that I think women get asked or uh, uh, pre-adoptive families get asked about is, would you accept alcohol in the third trimester versus the first trimester or, you know, and really this chart highlights the fact that the brain is developing from week three, basically, or from the very beginning, all the way throughout the entire pregnancy. Um, and really uh, the brain is developing pretty rapidly through the first six months and then through the first three years. And then really the brain doesn't stop developing. Uh, I mean, it never stops developing, but it really keeps growing and developing through 
early 20s. So, um, so I'm just as concerned about binge drinking in the second trimester as the third trimester as the first. Um, it really isn't something for me that it's like fine to drink in the third, third trimester. Um, uh, and then the other issue, uh, just going back to the development chart is that the facial features for alcohol are formed in a very specific window in the first month of pregnancy. So before many women even know that they're pregnant at all. Um, and so that really surprised me as well. So if you drink during the third trimester heavily and not really heavily or at all in the first trimester, you might actually have brain damage, but no facial features because those facial features are only damaged or impaired if you have drinking present in that very early time. So just um, to note. So now we can get into other drugs uh, or substances that are used prenatally as well. Um, and again, uh, when I talk to families in person, just one-to-one, -one, I always ask them what they do, because if they are like an international researcher on schizophrenia or something, you know, clearly my boiled down one sentence on schizophrenia is, is probably going to be too simplistic for that. So um, I do acknowledge that we're trying to, you know, get thousands of studies into a single sentence here. So there are lots of nuances and lots of caveats, but um, tobacco use during pregnancy, it may lead to low birth weight. That is actually pretty well established that if you're a heavy smoker, that the, the baby's growth may be restricted or that their head may be smaller. That said, most studies show no effects at about 10 cigarettes per day or less. So that's about a half a pack a day or less. Um, really, there weren't any effects that they could see or show. And um, high, higher tobacco exposure, exposure. So let's say they're smoking, you know, a pack a day or two packs a day um, every day for the pregnancy. Uh, there was a risk of minor learning or attention issues that was increased to about 10 or 20 percent. Um, general population risk for minor learning or attention issues is somewhere between three and six percent anyway. So, um, so it's never zero percent, but it is increased somewhat in kind of heavy tobacco exposure. So um, those kinds of things, I, I try very hard never to tell parents what to be okay with or what is uh, okay or not okay. However, um, I will say that uh, minor learning or attention issues are typically things that are pretty addressable at school or at home with, with interventions. So these kids typically do pretty well. So opioids, again, huge topic. We're in the middle of an enormous opioid crisis um, and Babies exposed to opioids in utero can have smaller heads, they can have lower birth weights, so similar to um, tobacco. Uh, that said, there's no consistent demonstration of increased birth defects, so there aren't things like, like with alcohol, you can have clefting, so a, a split in the lip or in the palate or both, um, for instance, as a birth defect. We don't really see any demonstration of increased birth defects from opioid exposure. Um, neonatal abstinence syndrome, so uh, that's when the babies are withdrawing. Uh, we see that almost the most with methadone and methadone is um, a treatment for opioid abuse. And so it's great that a birth mother is being treated and hopefully more stable on a methadone uh, prescription and, and monitoring. That said, methadone has such a long half-life, which is why it's useful in the treatment, but it causes more problems with neonatal abstinence syndrome because it just lasts in the system for so long. So babies will withdraw sometimes for a very long time. Um, and can need a prolonged hospital stay, not all, but can. Um, and so in those cases, sometimes we treat with tiny doses of op other opioids that we slowly wean off um, in order to treat those symptoms of, of withdrawal. But I do talk to parents about that short-term issue that you know, if they have a birth mother who's on opioids, whether it's a treatment opioid or uh, you know, a dr recreational drug or abuse, um, that that early period after the baby's born can be kind of rocky. So call in the family members, you know, call in friends to drop off meals because you may be in kind of a quiet room rocking a baby, you know, um, for a couple of days to weeks uh, and sometimes to months or sometimes they may need to be readmitted to the hospital. So we, we talk to them about that potential um, as a possibility just so that they are prepared. Developmental effects so the longer term effects. We don't have a ton of studies yet, which I was actually kind of surprised about because it's such an epidemic, but we don't have a lot of great long-term um, studies looking at uh, the effects. That said, um, there's some question of lower IQ scores or classroom services or speech therapy, but in those studies that were what, what we call confounding factors. And we'll talk about that with a lot of the different substances that we're about to look at um, because polysubstance abuse, environmental factors, socioeconomic status, maternal stress, all of those things can confound you know, how affected a baby is, whether in combination with a substance or um, 
the stress in and of itself or things like that. So it's sometimes hard to piece out what exactly is the cause of any sort of, you know, like lower IQ scores or classroom services. Um, so in the studies that looked at pr protective factors, so stable household, stable incomes, adoption um, as an intervention, so not being raised in the household that had previous or ongoing um, substance abuse, there was no difference in exposed versus non-exposed children. And that I think is really telling in terms of families who are um, either you know, in recovery or uh, adopting or in foster care or kinship, that if you do have protective factors and you do have a stable household for these children to grow up in, that really opioids is one that I am generally, I'm pretty optimistic about these kids. Um, so, you know, again, it's one of those things where we, we can, we would rather they not be abusing opioids, but if they are exposed, I'm generally quite optimistic about these kids. Um, I get a lot of questions often about different types. So there's lots of different types of opioids. There's heroin, there's fentanyl, there's Percocet, there's oxycodone, there's you know all sorts of different fentanyl. Um, there's all sorts of different substances that are all in that class that are considered opioids. Um, and really for me, it doesn't matter which opioid they were abusing or exposed to. Um, the main issue is that you can overdose on ones that are stronger. So fentanyl, very strong opioid, and you can technically overdose, meaning you can stop breathing. That's basically what opioids do. If you stop breathing, that's not good for the birth mother. That's not good for the baby to have lack of oxygen. You know, So that is the risk factor more than like the opioid itself. So um, you know, uh, again, uh, a lot of our experience here at, our, uh, at the AMC was born out of internationally adopted children. And back when I first started and my mentor who was looking at thousands and thousands of, re of referrals of kids from Russia, many of them, if not all of them, had some you know, heroin exposure, heroin substance abuse, opioid exposures. And those are the ones that we were the most optimistic about. Um, if that was their risk factor, great. If, they, you know, if it wasn't a documented alcohol problem, the ones who were, who were exposed to heroin or opioids or things like that, we were quite optimistic about. And we have seen those kids grow up you know, over the past 20, 30 years. So. Benzodiazepines. So uh, compared to opioids and alcohol, um, a lot of these next substances have less use or at least less frequent use. So we just don't have huge studies on most of these because um, you know, they're just not thousands and thousands of women who are abusing benzos. Um, that said, uh, some studies showed lower development at 18 months. And when we say lower development, we just mean some delays. It doesn't necessarily mean um, what we call intellectual disability or what we used to call mental retardation, which is you know, more significant. Uh, but just lower development. One study found no effects though from even attempted overdose, so meaning huge amounts of benzodiazepines or use in you know, certain trimesters. Maternal benzodiazepine use has been associated with some birth issues, so more C-sections, maybe some lower birth weight, some ventilator support. Um, benzodiazepines, so usually drugs fall into a, a, a class a lot of drugs fall into a class that we would classify as like uppers or downers. So meaning they kind of ramp you up or they kind of slow you down or calm you down. And benzodiazepines are kind of in that downer effect. And so that newborn ventilator support or not breathing as well at birth is not a surprise. Um, so benzodiazepines in general, uh, some caution, because again, you know, we would rather that they not use and we don't have huge long-term studies on women who have abused benzodiazepines. So it's kind of a yellow flag, but again, I'm usually pretty optimistic about kids who are exposed to benzodiazepines um, because again, even those studies with overdose or you know, significant use did not show any effects um, that we could see. So again, um, you know, I'm, I'm generally uh, optimistic about kids who had this exposure. Marijuana use is common in pregnancy. And um, at the time in 2018, when this study was done, it was about 5% of pregnant women. It's probably even higher now because of the legalization of marijuana in certain um, states. We know that THC, which is the active component in marijuana can cross the placenta. However, that risk is still unclear because again, a lot of women uh, can or will use marijuana in pregnancy, but a lot of them don't abuse it or you know, have high, high amounts every day or things like that. Um, and so it's a little bit uh, tricky to study it because, uh, again, if you have um, a cigarette, you know, there's certain amounts that go into each cigarette, right? They're processed, they're generally, you know, known how much tobacco is in each cigarette. Um, but marijuana, you know, if you're smoking it or rolling it or, um, you know, eating it in edibles or however you're ingesting marijuana, the amount is so variable that it's very hard to study. So, um, 
potential risks are that um, there's maternal blood carbon monoxide levels. So meaning, um, you know, the smoke that actually they're ingesting can, can be, you know, not ideal. It's, it's also what comes out of like car exhaust fumes. There can be decreased birth weight, higher chance of NICU admissions, decreased scores on memory attention and some hyperactivity. Again, not well controlled for those confounding factors. So the bottom line is that I think it's probably similar to tobacco exposure, meaning you know pretty much minimal risks. We more have to consider polysubstance use. Again, the amounts can be not well defined. I will say there's a more recent study that came in that showed um, probably some concern about marijuana use in pregnancy. Again, my issue with that study is that it, it may be true. However, the confounding issues were not well controlled for. And so if you can think about, um, let's say you're a birth mom who has ADHD, severe ADHD, um, and you know, you're always feeling like this and marijuana calms you down and makes you feel better, you're gonna use marijuana more if you're not well controlled or not being seen by a provider or not being controlled with you know, kind of the more standard medications that we have or other interventions. Um, so, your chance as a birth mother having HD is probably more if you're using marijuana and then your chance of having a child who also has ADHD is probably higher just because you had ADHD, not because you use the marijuana. You were, you were using that marijuana to kind of self-medicate. So if that makes sense, you know, a lot of these kind of confounding factors and um, genetic issues are not well uh, delineated in these, in these studies all the time. So um, again, just from the studies that I've read, from 15 years of seeing kids who are prenatally exposed, marijuana is one that I'm not generally concerned about. The caveat to that is that synthetic marijuana is very different from like the more traditional kind of the plant-based marijuana. Synthetic marijuana is sold at a lot of like smoke shops, not illegal. Um, and that is, if you look at the structure of synthetic marijuana, it is literally similar to rat poison, what they use to poison rats and, and you know, use it for pest control. Uh, to ingest that into the body is probably pretty significantly harmful. So I'm very concerned when I see synthetic marijuana being used on a regular basis. Methamphetamines. Um, methamphetamines cause constriction of blood vessels in the placenta, which can lead to growth restriction of the fetus. Um, it's also associated with some prematurity. Babies exposed to methamphetamine are at risk for, again, that kind of neonatal abstinence syndrome, like tremors, poor muscle control, poor feeding. It can last days to months, uh, similar to some of the opioid withdrawal. Methamphetamines is interesting to me because methamphetamines has also been an epidemic in this country, uh, also not well studied. Uh, there are very few big studies on methamphetamines in the literature, which I, you know, is confusing to me. I'm not sure why. Um, and so we just don't have great long term outcomes on methamphetamines. So, again, if you look at kind of the, um, the combination of studies that we do have, as well as you know, the clinical experience that I have seeing kids with methamphetamines, um, methamphetamines is one of the ones that I am more concerned about along with alcohol exposure because um, the kids who are exposed to the methamphetamines can have a similar um, kind of impulsivity, what we call phenotype or you know, kind of the things that they um, understand or don't understand is similar to alcohol. And so when I see methamphetamine exposed kids, you know, early on, I talked to our neuropsych people about whether we could term something, sorry, this is on a timer, uh, whether we could term something, uh, you know, FASD is fetal alcohol um, syndrome spectrum disorder, whether we could make one for methamphetamine uh, spectrum disorder or something like that. And there just hasn't been one that's been coined that name, but um, very similar to FASD kids in terms of methamphetamines. Similar also to FASD in that some kids are, heavily exposed to alcohol during pregnancy. I have worked with and seen kids who had 15 drinks every day in terms of exposure from a birth mother who had um, true you know, substance abuse problems. Um, and, uh, and they're fine, they're doing great. Um, and so similarly uh, with methamphetamine, some of the kids are doing just fine. Uh, their you know, cognitive range, our cognitive scores and impulsivity and what we call executive function are all in the normal range. And then some kids with methamphetamine exposure are not doing okay. Um, and again, there's so many different risk factors in terms of genetics and micronutrient deficiencies and um, amounts of exposure and how well your liver processes and how old you are and you know just so many different factors that we can't tell who is going to do okay and who won't. So, um, so that's why obviously we would rather you know babies not be exposed and women hopefully not uh, using methamphetamines during pregnancy. Um, because this is alcohol and methamphetamines are the two that I'm probably the most concerned about when I see them. So again, school-aged children who are exposed to meth um, experience some deficits in, again, that inhibitory control. So being able to 
uh, impulse control and stop themselves if they want to do something and they know that it's you know probably not okay. Um, some attention and verbal memory scores. And we have actually seen changes to the brain structures, which is again, why I think it's probably affecting the brain more than some of the other substances. Um, and so again, that's, that's my bottom line is that similar issues of kids uh, with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Cocaine. Um, so cocaine causes constriction of the blood vessels uh, and that can cause what we call IUGR or growth restrictions, some microcephaly or small head, premature birth and birth defects. Shortly after birth, they might have poorer regulation, more excitability in terms of stimuli, so sounds or lights or touch. There's a possible link to decreased language and memory scores in some school-age kids and adolescents. Again, when you look at those older studies, 90% of those women, so a lot of the big cocaine boom was kind of in the 90s and early 2000s, and a lot of those women who were using cocaine, which is an upper, were also using alcohol, which is a downer, to kind of like level out or even out. If you look at cocaine use, well, first of all, cocaine is dropped out of favor in terms of just women using it. Uh, opioids and methamphetamine have kind of taken over, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, you know, whatever the trend is. Um, Cocaine plus opioids, I'm actually very optimistic about those kids. Cocaine and alcohol, I'm not as optimistic because it's really the alcohol piece of that. And back in the 90s when we were studying this, 90% of women who were using cocaine as an upper were also drinking alcohol. So alcohol was really the big piece there to you know, figure out who was not drinking alcohol, if any of them. If you looked at cocaine as an isolated substance though, the adoption studies showed minimal to no difference in the long-term outcomes of kids who were exposed to cocaine, which is why I'm generally optimistic about kids who are exposed to cocaine. Um, and I actually had a research friend of, researcher friend of mine who devoted his entire career to studying these, you know, the crack baby epidemic, right, um, back in the 90s to show what their long-term deficits were and show what happened to them. And his bottom line after 20 years was that they were all doing pretty much fine <laughs> if you controlled for the other substances. And so, um, again, Cocaine can be harmful during pregnancy. It can cause that constriction of blood vessels can actually cause um, uh, certain structures to not come together. So for instance, the, the abdominal wall can be what we call infarcted or you know, not come together and stay open and then the, have the intestines exposed called um, uh, um, omphalocele or you know, different uh, gastroschisis problems. Obviously those are not good. Um, so we don't want cocaine during pregnancy, but if a baby is born and doing fine, and does not have any physical problems or strokes or you know gut issues or things like that, then I'm generally optimistic um, for cocaine as a substance that they're going to continue to define. Um, and just in the last couple of minutes, we have just inhalant use huffers. We don't see this often, but in uh, a little bit more popular in some international locations, and then we do see it occasionally. The main issue here is toluene, which is in um, spray paints and blood uh, paint thinners and glues and things like that. And toluene does seem to have an effect similar to alcohol, so similar to fetal alcohol syndrome, both in um, uh, child studies as well as some animal models. So if it really is significant inhalant or huffer use during pregnancy, I am pretty concerned about that. Lastly, antidepressant use, just a really common thing to see in pregnancy. Um, depression is common. So 20% of pregnant women and probably more than that um, ha have depression and the benefits of treating usually almost always outweigh the risks. And that's really kind of the bottom line that um, if you talk to OBs, if you talk to people, the benefits of having a healthy birth mother are much better than you know, the risks of, of any of the antidepressant use. Most are category C, so what we call potential risks seen in some animal studies, but really not seen in, in humans. There's one called Paxil, which is technically category D because it had a possible association between heart defects. Although at this point, that is something that most people um, don't really uh, think is probably a, a real association. And the use in the third trimester might be associated with a mild neonatal abstinence syndrome. So like a mild withdrawal usually resolves within two weeks and usually doesn't require uh, additional hospitalization. But again, I talked to parents about that as a potential so that if, um, you know, just so that they can be prepared to be a little bit more kind of, you know, hunkered down with a, with a baby and, um, you know, in a quiet space and, and making sure that they're prepared for that if that is, is a possibility. And then lastly, uh, birth parent with epilepsy, many types, many causes of seizures. I just talk about this because um, uh, we do see this, um, it's, it's related to the uh, you know, substance use or medication use in, in pregnancy. Really uh, the main thing to think about with a birth parent with epilepsy is 
that there can be a slightly increased inheritance if the birth mother has epilepsy. So two to 8%, depending on the study and what type of epilepsy she had, the general population risk is about 1%. Um, because now when we've looked at exposure to anti-epileptic medications during pregnancy, things called valproic acid used to be associated and thought to be associated with uh, cognitive deficits or problem sinking, but it was also linked to the baseline IQ of the, of the birth mother. The newer studies looked at VPA and cognitive effects and really don't show any problems with the VPA itself. Um, and the other meds that people use for seizure control during pregnancy really have not shown any long-term effects. So I'm typically not concerned about exposure to any anti-epileptic medications. It's more the consideration in talking to birth families or families who are adopting about the risk of epilepsy itself for longer term. So my pre-adoption recommendations or fostering recommendations uh, is for people to research as many terms as you can. It's always good to be more informed, but that Dr. Google needs to be taken with a very large grain of salt. Um, I always ask families or um, professionals even to use reputable.gov or .edu or some hospital-based websites for their information. Um, if they're seriously considering a certain condition to talk to families who have lived that experience. Um, always recognizing that, you know, in research, we always call it an N of one, meaning a, you know, a subject study of only one patient or person can only be taken as that one patient or person. But if that, you know, if they're living with effects of a certain substance or medication or medical condition, you know, it really helps to talk to families who have that lived experience. I can look at research all day long and tell you what the statistics are and tell you what the issues are. But if I haven't parented a child with that condition or lived that experience, it's a much different, much different experience. So and then, like I said, we have this pre-adoption consultation to go over checklists with families and ask their specific questions um, to someone who's uh, worked with, again, kids who were exposed, looked at the research, looked at kids in person and worked with families um, to see what it really looks like. Um, and then, again, once you have that exact specific file, consider having a professional review the information. Obviously we do this you know, at the AMC, but there are other places like at the University of Washington, Seattle who do almost exactly the same thing that we do. So I always tell people it doesn't have to be us, but really have someone review that file who understands adoption, understands prenatal substance exposures um, and can really advise and counsel on you know, the specific risks that they're seeing within a file. And our goal is to hopefully create happy, healthy families. So. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. I think we have about eight minutes left, so or 10 minutes left. So if there are any questions. Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Eckerly. And we do have a few questions coming in um, in the chat. So the first one um, is smoking 10 cigarettes a day while pregnant will not cause any harm to the developing fetus. So that's the question. Um, and are 10 cigarettes a day um, the tolerable upper intake level during pregnancy? So whenever we're talking about um, studies or you know what is the limit, right? Or things like that, we always have to look at the fact that we looked at maybe a thousand women who smoked. And of that thousand women, most, you know, it wasn't any more harmful than the women who didn't smoke. But maybe there was one woman in there who smoked 10 cigarettes a day and her baby actually was low birth weight or was affected or things like that. And again, because we just don't know about other risk factors like genetics or um, you know, your, your nutritional status or how your body specifically processes a substance. So in the studies in general, most women will not be affected by smoking 10 cigarettes a day. Again, some women will. So um, we don't ever advise to smoke 10 cigarettes a day. We would rather they not smoke or smoke less than that or try to quit or, you know, whatever it is for them. Um, but in the studies that we have, um, it didn't seem to have any major effect on, on the babies that were looked at at that level. Thank you. Um, and the next question is um, from Jennifer. Is it possible to receive a copy of the slides? Um, she said she was trying to take notes, but <laughs> some went too quickly. So, and, and yes, there's also going to be a recording of this, um, Jessica or Jennifer, that will get out to you as well. Um, we have another question, um, which was, what do you mean by yellow flag? Is marijuana a yellow flag? Yeah, so I mean, I talk about them very generally. So, you know, green light or, you know, green is means go, means no major concerns. We talk about red light or red flags as being like a major risk or a major problem that we're pretty sure is going to be a problem. Um, and then yellow is somewhere in the middle. So we just talk about it as like a caution, um, things to consider. 
uh, either because we just don't know, like we don't have good long-term studies, um, or I've seen in person just clinically the, the kids that come in that have been affected, you know, maybe in a minor way, not in a more major way. So yellow flag just means somewhere in the middle, that kind of gray zone, which um, frankly, you know, I don't like gray zones. I like to be very definitive. I like to say, yes, I'm just very optimistic or, or here, here are the risks that you're looking at. I don't like gray zones, but really the yellow flags typically fall in that range. And then there was a question that I think went along with that, with that last one. Um, she asked, are the only substances that you are concerned about alcohol and methamphetamines? Um, and I think it's more of a clarifying question there. Um, so I am concerned about alcohol and methamphetamines and I'm concerned about huffing um, as kind of the most risk. Again, what's confusing and what we, you know, the top researchers in the world don't know is why um, if you look at, let's say, alcoholic birth mothers who drank very heavily throughout their entire pregnancy without stopping at all, about half of their kids will be on the FASD spectrum and half of them will not. Half of them were exposed to huge amounts of alcohol and are doing just fine. And we don't exactly know why, you know, probably some protective genetic factors, probably age, probably how well the liver processes, you know, just so many different factors. So I'm generally uh, the higher risk substances are the alcohol and methamphetamines as well as probably huffing. Uh, but again, that's not to say that some of these kids who are exposed to these substances, even at very high amounts are still going to do fine. Um, so it's really just more about risk and, um, you know, the, the statistical numbers of kids who have more ongoing things to address versus kids who just are seemingly, you know, functioning kind of in the quote unquote normal range. Yep, it looks like we have just one last question here um, from Linda. Uh, what is your perspective on universal urine drug screening of prenatal patients? Um, and she said ACOG does support it but some systems do it in an attempt to prevent bias in selecting patients who are screened. Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, this is an issue that I have not looked at nearly as much as probably ACOG. And so if ACOG is supporting it, then I you know, would support it. I agree that the main reason to do that is because, um, uh, so for instance, I also work um, a little bit in a pediatric emergency room looking at kids and um, there are certain types of broken bones, there are certain types of injuries that we automatically refer to our, what we call safe and healthy team or our child abuse team. The reason we do that, the reason that they're just listed is so that they go, oh, you know, they're such a nice family. We're not gonna, you know, refer them. It doesn't matter. Nice family, not nice family, we're going to refer them. Um, and so to prevent bias, which, you know, inherently all of us have bias. I think that's very well established no matter how, you know, much we would rather not have bias or, you know, uh, and so to prevent that, I, I think that the universal screening is a good idea. And especially if ACOG has looked at that issue, then, um, then I, would, I would support that. And it looks like Linda just uh, wrote in the chat that she actually meant to say that ACOG does not support it. Oh, they so, don't. Oh, that's yeah. then, I, then I'll have to, I'll have to look at the issue more. Um, but yeah. my main concern or my main reason for supporting it would be the, the fact to prevent bias, because I do think, you know, especially in, like I said, in my experience uh, working with kids who come in with certain injuries, um, I think that Practitioners can be easily biased by certain factors, um, and we take that bias out of the picture if we're just universally screening. Or again, maybe we create a list of certain risk factors that would then trigger a screening. Maybe that would be a more, um, you know, similar to again the injuries that we see. I don't refer a kid for for child abuse screening if they stub their toe, right? Or you know, um, so if we create a certain list of certain injuries or certain risk factors, you know, maybe that is a, a more judicious way to do it. I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. I don't know if anybody wanted to get one last question in. <laughs> this would be the time. Um, but if not, I will pass it to Nicole. Great. Thank you so much, Zora, for um, moderating the Q&A. This was really wonderful. I just want to thank Dr. Judith Eckerly again. I've had the pleasure of speaking with her and then corresponding in email, but I must say I learned so much today, so much valuable information and it's been a while. And so this was really helpful for me in my work. So I wanna thank you and applaud you for the work that you are doing in the community because it's so needed. We need to be educated and not be led by fear, 
right or myth. So I thank you so much for your presentation. We want to also invite everyone here today to join us for our next series, which will be on December 1st. And there will also be a follow-up on December 8th um, with Dr. Rachel Hardiman. On December 1st, she will be speaking on mama's reproductive justice and police violence. And on December 8th, she will be speaking on Black Babies Matter. Again, we thank you so much for your support in these ECHO series. Um, we want to reduce and, and bring awareness, awareness around maternal and infant health. Um, and we can only do this work with our, our network. And so again, thank you, Dr. Judith Eckerly for being one of the members in our supportive network. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, this will recording will be posted in maybe a week or two and you will receive a survey. So we hope that you will complete that survey and uh, join our um, listserv. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you for having me.